Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And this lesson number eight for August 24 of 2019 is entitled, The Least of These. So this is a double punch, I guess, for The Least of These. As always, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, these lessons are a challenge to us and yet they are an inspiration. Help us to know how we can best serve you by following some of these advice, bits of advice that you have given us. May we reach out more successfully to those around us each day as as a result of our study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We should start probably by saying what shouldn't need to be said at all. Christians have one example whom it is always safe to follow, and that example is Jesus. Jesus. So what example did Jesus leave us in dealing with the poor and needy? Try to imagine what our lives would be like if we, and a, let's say a complete Sabbath school class, actually tried to follow the example of Jesus to the best of our ability. Would it affect the communities in which we live? Mm-hmm. I think it would have to. Living a Christ-like life is very different from living a worldly-oriented life. How much time do we spend each day thinking about how we can meet the needs of others? In what ways can we most effectively serve others in our situation today? Do you think it was easier for the people in Jesus' day to carry out these ideals? Everybody was just waiting around to see how they could reach out to other people? Did some of them try? Well, well, as we've discussed in other times, the needy, being in need, proved that you were a sinner. Mm-hmm. Being poor or that was what or, they believed. Or sick proved in their minds that you were, that that person was a sinner and needed help. Yeah. Well, we have to look at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount to to really set the tone for our lesson. Jesus saw the crowds and went up a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered round him and he began to teach them. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. (coughs) Do you know anybody who's like that? Happy are those who are merciful to others. God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart. They will see God. Happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happiness. I'm sorry. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. You are like salt for the whole human race. But if salt has lost its saltiness, there's no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on the lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and do what? Think you're a great person? No. No. Praise your Father in heaven. Wow. Well, each of these Beatitudes and the lifestyles recommended after them could be discussed for hours, and I'm sure we've all heard sermons on probably every single one of these. Think about the implications of living a righteous life, practicing humility, mercy, peacemaking, as well as being pure in heart. What would it be like to be salt and the light in the world? We don't know for sure how many people were standing around when he preached that sermon. How many of them were were able to reach out to somebody else and help them? Or were they all just very poor how many of them were so poor that they needed someone to help them what kind of people actually 
were there. Dennis? Well, in Matthew 4.25, it says, Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the ten towns from Jerusalem, Judea, and the land on the other side of the Jordan. Um, it's from Good News Bible. And then in Mark 3, 7 to 8, Jesus and his disciples went away to Lake Galilee, and a large crowd followed him. They had come from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the territory of Idumea, from the territory on the east side of the Jordan, and from the region around the cities of Tyre and Sidon. All these people came to Jesus because they had heard of the things he was doing. Wow. I mean, of course, think about it. If you hear, if you're sick, for example, and you hear that there's someone who can just touch you and make you well. I mean, we're talking about an international, huge international gathering here. Idumea, that's clear almost down, almost in Egypt. And Tired and Sidon, that's 200 miles yeah, or more. Way, right? Tired and Sidon yeah. up in the north. And right. Syria, over on the other side. I right. mean, people came from m- hundreds of miles away to, to hear Jesus. And that was in a day when you didn't get on uh, Southwest no. Airlines and travel no. across the country. No, certainly didn't. Well, so we're going to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive, et- receive eternal life? Jesus answered him, what do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Finished. Discussion. He's already answered his own question, right? Well, why were they asking him questions? Trying to trap him. They were trying to find some way to catch him saying something that they could use to trap him. However, he always came up with an answer that made them look foolish. (laughs) You have to feel sorry for them, but his answers are so marvelous that you just have to smile. uh, In this story, the teacher of the law actually answered his own questions. The Jews argued incessantly about the question of who was their neighbor. The Pharisees wanted to know whether they should treat the Sadducees as their neighbors. There were even different groups within the Pharisees. Okay, do I treat these other groups within the Pharisees? There were seven different groups of Pharisees. And, 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 And then, of course, the hoi polloi, as the Greeks would have called them, the ordinary people. You know, there were never allowed to be more than 6,000 Pharisees. And there are much fewer Sadducees. So the, by the far, the majority of the Jewish people didn't belong to either one of those groups. So the question is, do I really need to love all those people out there? Who is my neighbor? Well, of course, is when, when he realized that he had sort of made a fool out of himself because he could answer his own question, immediately, of course, his, his mind went to what? Who is my neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this led Jesus to the giving of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I can read the rest of the story. You are right, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, There was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him. And if you... Know the way there. That was a in the olden days. It was a little narrow canyon, and there were, you know, big rocks and things. It was very easy for someone to hide. Anyway, they stripped him, beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the men, he walked by, walked on by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over, looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way, came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal, took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, In your opinion... Which one of these three? Oh man! Which one of these three acted like a neighbor towards a man attacked by the robbers? What, you know? What can you say at this point? Well, there are several uh, Im- very important issues that we need to understand about this story. 
Okay, Jackie? In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others, in genuine goodness. Desire of Ages, 497. This, this was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's word. This wow. is from Desire of Ages, 499, paragraph I mean, one. would you want to crawl in a hole or what? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, okay, Jim? Next section, Ellen White writes the review in Herald in January of 1895, and it starts out, which made me question, the Levite was of the same tribe as was the wounded, bruised sufferer. Right. And I guess I didn't think about the guy that got beat up yeah. and robbed being a Levite. All heaven watched as the Levite passed down the road to see if his heart would be touched with human woe as he beheld the man he was convicted of what he ought to do, but as it was not an agreeable duty, he wished he had not even come that way, so that he need not have seen the man who was wounded and bruised, naked, looked like he was dying and in want of help from his fellow men. Mm -hmm. He passed on his way, persuading himself that it was none of his business and that he had no need to trouble himself over the case. Claiming to be an expositor of the law, to be a minister in sacred things, he yet passed by on the other side, probably acting wow. like he didn't even see him. Yeah. So the first two were from the same tribe. No, the second the priest, one. The priest, well, the priest also was yeah, a Levite. The priest was a Levite. The priest was a Levite, yeah, and the Levite was a Levite. So well, both of them well, were of the same the tribe same as the person yes. who was, was lying in the road there. Yes. That's correct. Family members. Family was the guy lying in the road aware that they were passing by? Probably unconscious. Yeah. Well, <coughs> the, 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 the guy who helped him move. put him on his animal, I don't think you'd put an unconscious man on an animal. Mm. That was the only way to take someone at the time. Yeah. Was so who knows? We yeah. Don't know. They do it in the movies. Yeah, they do. I suppose you could <laughs> flop him over. <laughs> That didn't sound like a very friendly. Comedy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> face down wow. into the side of the mule. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a okay. weird picture. Okay, No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are... And women. One, yes. yes. Uh, man and women. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of petition, to throw open every compartment of the temple that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. That's from Christ's Obvious Lessons 386, paragraph 3. So, try to imagine the embarrassment of the Jews as Jesus pointed to an outsider, someone who was considered to be unfaithful to God and even unsavable as the one who did what was right in helping that Levite who was in trouble. How do you think the Levite and the priest standing among the crowd felt as Jesus told the story? How would you feel if you'd been one of them? Try to kind of go to the back of the crowd and hide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's very likely yeah. that the one who had been beaten up, probably when he got well, came and told his story. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, there's something else we need to think about. So, from Gordon? the adult teachers, I was school Bible study guide, page 107. Years ago, a group of psychologists conducted a study based on the story of the Good Samaritan. They met with a group of theology students, priests, and asked them to, each of them to prepare a short talk on the theme of the Good Samaritan. Then they were to walk through an alley to a nearby building to present the talk. On the way there, each student encountered an actor playing the part of a man sprawled in the alley groaning and coughing. Myra? 
Sorry, I was engrossed in the story. <laughs> <laughs> that alleyway and those students. <laughs> Few students stop to help the man or ask him if he was okay. Some even stop, stepped over the victim to get to their speaking appointment in the next building. Wow. The psychologist concluded that compassion and love for humanity all too often works in theory, but not in practice. Brian Patterson, Ooh. being the Good Samaritan, <laughs> is more than just showing compassion. That was in the Herald Sun. Jim? Oh. <clears throat> C.S. Lewis is credited with saying, it is easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are un uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, 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 in my work, the, you, you, what you observe this, the people who need love the most are probably the least lovable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really sad. You know, yeah. it's been said that you can fake love, but you mm. can't fake mercy. Think about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you feel about that experiment? Was that fair? Huh. How do you think you would have responded? I'm surprised any psychologist understood about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa. I've worked with some pretty weird ones over the years. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I have the privilege of working with some very nice psychologists, so they're not all like that. Well, how would you respond, or how do we respond if we come upon someone who needed help? Is your church known for being open to helping those in need? Try to summarize in your own mind the parable of the Good Samaritan. What was the mindset of the priest and the Levite? I want to, I want to stop and just flesh out that story a little bit. If you stopped to help somebody like that and you cleaned them up and you did all this kind of stuff and you were a Levite or a priest, what happens when you get to Jerusalem? Oh, you're, you're unclean. unclean. Yeah, you're yeah, unclean. You can't participate. You would probably have to go through se as much as a week of cleansing mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. you could do. And, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I'd like to help you really, but... I have, I have to rush up here and I have an important job to do and, and, and I, I wouldn't dare to contaminate myself. Now, were they going up or down? Well, it says the man was going down. Yeah. I, but it, the fact that the... Well, what I know, and maybe my, I'm influenced by this, if you travel that road today, there's an inn that's almost to the top of the hill, almost to Jerusalem, that they say this is the inn where... So that would suggest that he got hold of he, when he when he got the man helped him he took him up the hill, okay. and so I would presume that they were going that same direction. But that maybe is just so my. up up the hill going to Jerusalem to his two weeks of work yes. in the temple. In any event, they would have had to gone through some type of cleansing period in order to. Well, no, the Samaritan didn't have to go through cleansing, right? No. I mean, the, he was already the, contaminated. The, the, yeah. <laughs> the priest and the Levi. <laughs> now, now uh, was this yeah, something that could have happened, or was it that really something oh, yes. that really happened? It did happen. It did happen. Oh, we read that. Yeah, it we did. Ellen White said it Ellen happened. White. Okay. So okay. they were in the audience listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I thought all along, I thought this was a parable or this is a story, but you know. This is a real story. Yeah, the real thing that happened, yeah. So here's the, here's the difference between those two groups, the, the two versus the Samaritan. With the mindset of the priest and the Levite as they passed by the suffering vic victim, they were thinking, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Mm -hmm. How is this going to impact me? I mean, th those robbers might still be behind that rock over there somewhere. They were right? thinking of themselves. They were thinking. Well, it's a valid concern. Yes. But. <laughs> well, but. I also have something important to do. Come on. I'm going to the temple. Mm -hmm. why, why bother here? Yeah. What if you were Zacchaeus and you were really short and you couldn't even lift that? You couldn't help that man. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. 
I mean, know. the guy that helped him, he had to have some yeah, umfra. Presumably. And he had money. And he had money. He had wine and oil and mm -hmm. so and forth. And he had a donkey. And, and he had expertise. a donkey. Yeah. <laughs> but and expertise. It, Zacchaeus was there. You see, in um, emergency situations, we get all the strength. He would find a way I, to do it, I'm sure. You know, there's a very interesting story. I know that this story is true because it happens to people I know. But amazing story uh, of an auto accident that happened in Colorado, one of the mountain roads in Colorado many, many years ago. And the, there was a car just almost just tipped on the edge like this. And several big men uh, uh, tried to push it back to get it back on the road. And one of the people who was in the car when it got into that position, one of the people involved in the accident, was a teenage girl. And she went around and pushed that car back on the road by herself. Mm. And I don't know, maybe it was an angel. I just don't know. But I, I, It I was mean, her family in the car. Her then. family in the car. Yeah. Well, she obviously has some an, an angelic Plen help. <laughs> yeah. And plenty of epinephrine going through the <laughs> veins, probably. That's the fact. Uh, in, in, terms of, in times of emergency situations, mm -hmm. we get tremendous amount of strength. Mm-hmm. So, but well, the, what, did the, what did the Samaritans say? If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Mm -hmm. he was what a difference. The other person yeah. mm -hmm. wasn't thinking of himself. What a difference. Well, we're going to go to another story. Look at Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. And I don't know whether this man was named Lazarus by accident or what, <laughs> because you know what's going to happen pretty soon. There's another Lazarus that is going to be raised from the dead. Anyway, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, where he was in great pain, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me, send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue, because I'm in great pain in this fire. But Abraham said, remember, my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things, while Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he's enjoying himself here while you're in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit be lying between us and so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over to us from where you are. Now, think about how preposterous that story is. Here's Abraham with God over there, and there, there's some kind of a... You can talk across, back and forth across this ditch, but you, or this Grand Canyon or whatever it is, but you can't come... I mean, you know... And I mean, Jesus is telling the story. Yes, so Seems why like did Jesus tell an such a story? Well, and, we'll talk and about that. Why is it recorded? <laughs> well, the story, the truth is because there's a story like this that came out of Egypt that was <coughs> commonly known. Um, yes. And so he's, he's parroting that story. But, but I really hope we spend a little time, I know we have 33 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, on this. Because yeah. as we speak with our friends, Adventists are the only people, perhaps only Christians, mm -hmm. who don't believe in an eternal hell. Recently, I was in the plane, and beside me was a lady, and we started to talk. Our son was in the cockpit, you know, I did that. But anyways, and we said, then she says, come on, Charles, you know, eternal hell is there. See, Lazarus, you know, so... And the uh, unfortunate story, yes. in a way. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we, we spend a little time on that. Did you want me to read? Them? Well, the punchline yeah. of that story, many people don't ever get there, and that is, yeah. you got Moses and the prophets, learn there, mm -hmm. and uh, then you can get things figured out. But uh, many times you just stop there, and, and uh, Billy Graham was uh, comforted that he's going to go to Abraham's bosom. Yeah. Well, the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, where I have five brothers. Let him go and warn them, so that they at least will not come to this place of pain. Abraham said, Your brothers have Moses and they and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. 
The rich man answered, That's not enough, Father Abraham, but if someone were to rise from death and go to them, then they would turn from their sins. Okay, and the Lazarus is about to be raised, a real Lazarus is about to be raised from the dead, and they all turn from their sins, right? But Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone were to rise from death. And then you got the story of that of Lazarus. Somebody did rise from the, Lazarus raised from the dead, and uh, it had no positive Im- impact on the uh, religious leaders. And Jesus well, rose from the dead. They plotted to kill him. Not long, weeks. <laughs> we don't know for sure, but weeks, maybe a couple months. And then, and of might. course, Jesus rose from the dead too, mm-hmm. and they plotted to cover that up. I listened to Moses and the prophets. That's referring to the Old Testament. Is that yes. correct? Mm-hmm. That's correct. Scriptures. Yeah. Well, the story of the rich man Lazarus. In the days of Jesus, there were no governmental departments administering social welfare, no community hospitals, no soup kitchens. It was common for people in desperate need to beg outside the homes of the wealthy. It was expected that the rich would share a little bit of their wealth to alleviate the suffering of the poor. Notice this comment by Ellen White about the rich man in this story. An interesting comment. The rich man did not belong to the class represented by the unjust judge, who openly declared his disregard for God and man. He claimed to be a son of Abraham. He did not treat the beggar with violence or require him to go away because the sight of him was disagreeable. If the poor, loathsome specimen of humanity could be comforted by beholding him as he entered his gates. The rich man was willing that he should remain, but he was selfishly indifferent to the needs of his suffering brother. Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons, uh, 261, paragraph 1. Selfishly indifferent. Well, we know that Jesus had some pretty strong things to say about the selfishly rich people of his day. And if you if you look a few um, verses before the this, mm-hmm. it says now the Pharisees who were lovers of money mm-hmm. were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. So yeah. these were the the ones who were listening to this, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't their understanding of what happened when we died that was keeping them from Jesus. It was their love of money. Yeah. Well, there's. I think maybe we have time to read it. Look at Luke twelve thirty one. Th- I'm sorry, thirteen to twenty one. A man in the crowd said to Jesus, "Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us." Jesus answered him, "My friend, who gave me the right to judge or to divide the property between you two?" And he went on to say to them all, "Watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed, because a person's true life is not made up of the things he owns, no matter how rich he may be." Then Jesus told them this parable. There was once a rich man who had land which bore good crops. He began to think to himself, I haven't anywhere to keep all my crops. What can I do? This is what I will do. He told himself, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones where I can store my corn and all my other goods. Then I will say to myself, Lucky man, you have all the good things you need for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool, this very night you will have to... Give up your life. Then I, who will get all these things that you have kept for yourself? And Jesus concluded, this is, how, this is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves but are not rich in God's sight. Wow. Well, now, let's be honest. There is no evidence in the Bible of, that either of these rich men became rich by doing anything wrong. Maybe they had worked very hard. Maybe God had blessed them. But something went wrong where? In their thinking, as we know, this story has been used by our uh, by Christian brothers and sisters to support the idea of an ever burning hell. In fact, Jesus was just using a belief common among the people in his day to make a spiritual point. Jesus could have said what Paul later said: "The love of money is the root of all evil." First Timothy six verse ten. So, how often do we allow the love for money to distort how we live? I'll let you think about that, you out there. On Jesus' final day in the temple in Jerusalem, he made some comments which raised questions in the minds of his disciples. 
Matthew 24, 1 to 3. Jesus left and was going away from the temple when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Yes, he said, you may well look at all these things. I tell you this, not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us when these, all this will be, they asked, and what will happen to show that it is the time of your coming in the end of the age. Good wow. Bible. Here's this gorgeous temple made with marvelous, beautiful white marble and stuff covered with gold and so forth like this. And Jesus says, not a stone is going to be left on, on top <coughs> of another. And I'm sure the disciples were shocked to hear him say that. Well, Jesus went on to describe several parables which have reference to the events at the end of time. Would you be considered one of the foolish virgins or one of the wise virgins? Remember the ten <coughs> virgins. Mm -hmm. How much oil of the Holy Spirit do you have stored up? Will Jesus commend you for having done good to the poor and needy? Wow. And remember these words, which are the real punchline here. When the Son of Man comes as King and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne and the people of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people on his right and the others on his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by my Father. Come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. And think how many of us would love to be in that situation. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes naked and you clothed me I was sick and you took care of me in prison and you visited me the righteous will then ask him answer him when when Lord did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink when did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes or naked and clothe you when did we ever see you sick or in person and visit you the king will reply I tell you whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Away from me, you that are out under God's curse, away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you, did, you would not feed me, thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes, naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him, when, Lord, did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, wherever you, whenever you refuse to help one of these least important ones, you refuse to help me. These then will be sent off to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Wow. Could it really be possible that the entire judgment will be based on how we have dealt with the poor and needy in this life? Is it also possible that Jesus considers the poor and needy as if they were himself, Jesus himself? Do we have any other support for that idea in Scripture? Well, on his way to Damascus, Paul was struck down by that brilliant light. Notice a brief conversation between himself and Jesus. Acts 9, verse 5. Who are you, Lord? he asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecute, the voice said. But get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. I am Jesus, whom you persecute. What is he saying? He was persecuting the Christians, mm -hmm. and Christ was referring to them as perse persecuting himself. Another example of the fact that if, we, if you've done it on one of these, to these you've done it unto me. So here's a, a second proof of that right there. So when you see a beggar beside the road, do you think of Jesus? Margaret? Christ tears away the wall of partition, the self-love, the dividing prejudice of nationality, and teaches a love for all the human family. He lifts men from the narrow circle that their selfishness prescribes. He abolishes all territorial lines and artificial distinctions of society. 
He makes no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. He teaches us to look upon every needy soul as our neighbor and the world as our field. This is Ellen G. White from the Thoughts of Amount of Blessings, page 42. Wow. Yeah, did you want to come in? I'll, I'll read the next one. Okay. The standard of the golden rule is the rule is the true standard of Christianity. Anything short of it is a deception. A religion that leads men to place a low estimate upon human beings whom Christ has esteemed of such value as to give himself for them. A religion that would lead us to be careless of human needs, sufferings, or rights is a spurious religion. Mm. In slighting the claims of the poor, the suffering, and the sinful, we are proving ourselves traitors to Christ. It is because men take themselves take upon themselves the name of Christ while in life they deny his character that Christianity has so little power in the world. Also from thoughts from, from the Mount of Blessing. 136 and 137. Whoa! Do the ideas in this lesson make us uncomfortable? Does our understanding of Christian doctrine make it unnecessary for us to care? I mean, we have a message to take to the world, right? We don't have time to be taking care of the poor and the needy. Well, didn't didn't that used to be kind of the attitude? I think so. <laughs> How could that be? Wow. It's not just the poor and the suffering. It's the sinful as well. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with those that we see as being sinners? You mean ourselves? <coughs> <laughs> I don't or want poor, names on... Or poor and needy that we could say they brought it on themselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we, ta if we claim to be end-time Christians and Seventh-day Adventists, does that make it more necessary that we reach out to the poor and needy? I mean, if we're claiming to be Christ's kind of people at the end of this world's history, at the worst possible time, doesn't that mean that we should be doing it more? We are now almost 175 years after the Great Disappointment in 1844. Does our relationship to the poor and the needy have anything to do with this long delay? I'll let you think about that out there. But I'll ask you here, what do you think? Could it have something to do with the long delay? Well, that was one of the sins that uh, Sodom was <coughs> criticized for. We always think it was the sexual perversions, but uh, mm -hmm. what was it? Ezekiel says it was because you ignored the widows and the needy. Yeah. Well, once again, I ask the question, what would happen if a Seventh-day Adventist church today could fully implement the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount? We'd be going home soon. Yeah. We'd be going home soon. Revival of primitive godliness. Yeah. What possible avenues could be used to deal with injustice, poverty, and disease? Could we actually live a life like the life of Jesus in our day? Now, Carrie, Lord I think that's Jesus yours. Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, that he might minister to every need of humanity. It comes from Matthew 8:17, I guess. The burden of disease and wretchedness and sin he came to remove. It was his mission to bring to men complete restoration. He came to give them health and peace and perfection of character. That comes from Ministry of wow. Healing, page 17, paragraph 1. What more could we ask for? Well, one of the things we need to learn to do is to understand others clearly so that we understand their views and needs as they see them. Is that easy to do? How good are we at doing that? Well, how would you judge yourself? And you out there, how would you judge yourself in that category? So again, this quote yeah. from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, the Beatitudes possibly reference justice. 
For example, the Greek word for righteousness is the well in the well-known beatitude in Matthew 5:6 is sometimes translated as justice. In fact, as we noted in an earlier lesson, the words righteousness and justice are at times used interchangeably in both the Old and New Testaments. Pri- primarily one Hebrew and Greek word is used for both terms. And Ken will give us those words. The Hebrew word is... Sedek is the Hebrew and Greek is dekaiosune. One example of the interchangeability of justice and righteousness in English is seen in the New Living Translation where it says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice for they will be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. Now I have a problem with that. And it's not because I have a problem with what the Bible says. I believe absolutely that the Bible is correct, and I absolutely agree that in the Bible times, the words justice and righteousness were the same word, was used for both those ideas. What's the problem in our day? They're not the same. Those two words have come to mean something quite different. When you think of justice... I mean, we have a justice system. What does a justice system deal with? We have colleges, uh, criminal justice programs. Yes. And, 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 and uh, a oxymoron. department of justice. Yeah. Yeah. Criminal justice, wow. And what does righteousness mean? Well, it still has more or less the meaning that it originally had in biblical times because it's, it's a word that's... I mean, how often do you use the word righteousness in your ordinary business almost never it still it has overtones from the Bible as soon as you say righteous or righteousness we think of biblical things don't we mm-hmm. well so how should we deal with this issue Myra I think you have something on that yes from the good news Bible I'm reading Matthew 5 6 happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires God will satisfy them fully. Okay, let me just interrupt there for a second. Think of the implications of that. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. What, what, what's implied by that? Anybody want to comment? Well, uh, Psalm says it's... Uh, I... Um, I have come to do thy will, yea, thy law is within my heart. Yeah. Or some I version yeah, of that. I delight. Yeah, I, I delight to do thy will. Yeah. Yeah, which is what Jesus came to do, came to do the will of the Father. Why is it that not many of us are delighting to do God's will in our day? Because our own will is corrupted. We How could that happen? At the fall. Yeah. We're born that way. And everybody every everybody since that time, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, Myra, sorry for the interruption. That's right. Ma- um, Psalms 37, 12 to 17. The wicked plot against good people and glare at them with hate. But God laughs at the wicked people because he knows that they will soon be destroyed. The wicked draw their Does swords. Does that sound like the that's, God you no. know? That's a terrible translation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How do you really think, Kim? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I tried to get my point across, but <laughs> not too gently. Okay, continuing on here. Uh, the wicked draw their swords and bend their bows to kill the poor and needy, to slaughter those who do what is right. But they will be killed by their own swords and their own bows will be smashed. The little good, The little that a good person owns is worth more than the wealth of all the wicked because the Lord will take away the strength of the wicked to protect those who are good. Wow. You think that's what Jesus had in mind when he said what we read We read back there in Matthew 5, verse 6, happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires? What do you think? It's pretty much a similar idea, isn't it? Yeah, well, definitely says it a little different. Okay, so now we are urged by Jesus to be salt and light. What does it mean? What happens to salt? 
It, okay, one of the things it does is under certain circumstances, it's a preservative. It mixes in with taste. everything. Mix, mix Whatever you put it in, I mean, this is a chemical, and it's yeah. easily dissolved in water, and so what does it do? It just it permeates it everything that you put it with, yeah. right? Okay, what does light do? It fills the room. Yeah. There's an ancient Indian story, a native Indian here in America story about three sons of the one of the one of the chiefs. He said, "Okay, I will I will make the the, the son who who fills here's a room here, and the son who can fill the room most completely with something will be the next chief with the least amount of money." Well, could have been that too. Yeah. I don't remember that part. That anyway. And you know, the one son came with a whole bunch of rocks, and he started to stuff them in. And the others came, I think, with I don't remember something else that he was stuffing in there. And they never came. And the third son came with a candle and lit the candle and filled the room with light. Yes. So isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Okay, Charles, I believe you're. No, it's Jim. Jim. No, I'm sorry, Jim. Uh, we have. Ver uh, Someone yeah. once said that it is harder to be salt than light. What important role do both salt and light have in social ministry? That is, or for example, light generally shines from afar, making dark, darkness appear, appear and helps us to find what is lost. Being salt, however, takes extra commitment because it must mingle mm -hmm. with the ingredients different from itself in order to Excuse me, in order for its healing properties to have an impact. Wow. Would it be, what, what would happen if we as Seventh-day Adventists really mingled? Would we lose our way? Uh, we would be called wine beavers sometimes. <laughs> that has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Depends it's... Depends on how anchored we are in, in God. If we keep the Lord ever before us. <coughs> in other words, in every if we see these sinners, these people in need or whatever, as as doing it unto the Lord, uh, then we maintain our focus. If we get drawn into, like um, Paul says in Galatians six one and two, you who are spiritual. Uh, restore if you catch somebody in a fence. Restore some uh, someone, mm -hmm. uh, but looking to yourself, lest you too be uh, yeah. drawn away. So, in other words, looking at how weak you are, how weak I am, lest I be tempted to condemn the person that I'm trying to help. Yeah, could uh, Seventh Day Adventists be modern day Waldenses? Only a think of them, and I th I just can't imagine how they were able to live amongst the society that was there at that time and maintain. Incredible. For years, I mean, hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. They were going out, and they were traveling around the world, and they were going to... I mean, Ellen White talks about the time when one of their group went to, to Paris. And Paris was so controlled by the Catholic Church in those days. And this person went around, he went to different universities and so forth like this, but, and of course they were looking for him. And they never could find him because his, his influence always was just about one or two steps ahead of them. Of course, I'm sure God was protecting him, but what, what would happen if we Adventists were doing that in our day? Uh, is it going to happen? Yeah, it is going to happen. Little Piedmont what, what, College. Yeah. It's going to happen in places. What are we waiting for? <laughs> Mark fourteen seven. Is that yours? Mark fourteen seven. You will always have the poor with poor people with you, and any time you want to, you can help them. But you will not always have me. Good news Bible. Some people use this verse as an excuse to ignore the type of the list of this, the poor. The reason, because the poor will always be with us, the problem is not, will not go away. Anyway, Jesus himself said it, 
if you have the poor with you always mark 17 14 7 mm -hmm. so why try to solve the problem and else have uh, self yeah. accordingly well was jesus the first one to talk like that no who else talked about like that well that that's for you to read, I think. Well, yeah. <laughs> You're going to comment. Or Deut Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 15, verses 4 and 5 and 11. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that he is giving you. Not one of your people will be poor. If. 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 Oh, you notice that too. Mm -hmm. If you obey him and carefully observe everything that I command you. In other words, if you every seven years return things and every... Fifty years, you returned everything back to its original. What would happen? How many times did they do that? We're not. A, we're not. None? We're not aware that they ever did it completely. There may have been some people who did a little. Did some of it. But we, there's no no reference in the Bible that they ever did it completely. Hmm. Well, and then a few verses later, it says there will always be some Israelites who are poor and in need, and so I command you to be the to be generous to them. Now. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Don't does verses four and five contradict with verse eleven? Superficially, it might look like that, right? But if they practice it, see, we don't know that they did practice. So that's why perhaps this is a prophetic statement that yeah, we I know what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, you're going to pass the law, but you're not going to be under that law. Well, does the fact that there will always be poor people on earth primarily because of the injustice of other people, other human beings excuse us from reaching out and trying to help them? No. Well, it just depends on what's in our hands. Now, if we say, well, we're going to solve this whole problem and there's going to be no poor people in America anymore and we think we can pass laws to make that a reality... Uh, that might be, you know, is that really within our power? But you and I individually could do things, you yeah. know, for those who are at hand. Well, you know that lots of studies have been have been done showing that if if the wealth, well, if, if food, let's just take food alone, if food food were evenly distributed over the world, which would be very difficult to accomplish, but if it were evenly, there would be plenty of food for everybody. There's no question about that. I mean, that's been demonstrated very well. And that's especially <coughs> people who stop eating so much meat. Yeah. It, it takes ten times as much land to produce mm -hmm. one pound of meat as it takes to produce one pound of vegetable protein. And water. And water. And much, water. Much, much yeah. more water. Yeah. 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 And Bra in Brazil, they have to cut down for rainforests in order to grow those <laughs> cows. And there's pretty good evidence now that when they cut down the rainforest in Brazil, it causes drought in Africa. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And then we don't talk about the carbon dioxide. Yeah. Vehicles are not the big problem. No, it's the problem no. is in the farm, farm. agriculture. Yeah. I mean, the, the yeah. cattle. That's going yeah. Yeah. Does the fact that there will always be poor people on this earth, primarily because of the injustice of other human beings, excuse us from reaching out trying to help them? No. No. Mm -mm. But I think, to me, it's wrong for me to put some money in the panhandlers. Uh, we don't know, but we get to, perhaps if I have the time to get to knowing who they are and what they're doing, they have done studies. I mean, they, say mm -hmm. they make $73,000 a year. They don't pay taxes on it. Is, so we can get into that, but we can choose. I think it is important for us to choose to to want to know some people that we want to help and do everything yeah. we can to help them. If all Christians were really good Samaritans, would the poor and needy disappear? No. In our world, they have they have choices too. They have mm -hmm. choices of how they prefer <coughs> to live. Not yeah. that they want to be poor, but uh, maybe their choices is what has make has made them poor. And we know that a lot of those who are out there living on the street are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's part of the problem. So are we fighting a losing battle if we try to help the poor? No. No. Um, everyone that's helped is helped. I mean... Well, they used to, the, the mentally ill used to be in institutions, and uh, which my mother worked in, in a couple of them. 
one close by here and one uh, at some distance. And there was a time when uh, they had uh, gardens and the people would go out and work and they would do stuff. And then somebody decided that that was, uh, and they yeah. produced their own food that way. And then, then somebody decided that that was an unjust thing to do to make these people work. So that descended into them sitting around smoking and playing cards most of the time. Uh, that became an economic yeah. uh, big, burden then because they weren't producing their own food. Trade unions demanding if you're going to do that, you pay them the, the wage that goes with that kind of work. That's what stopped a lot. That's of craziness. Tomorrow, tomorrow is D Day. Yeah. Twenty veterans kill themselves every day in this country. Now, mm -hmm. that is sobering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and just to add what Dennis said, uh, there's proof that uh, at prisons that have been that are where they feed a vegetarian diet, the amount of problems is way down. Well. I think oh, I have one you have one more you. I'd like you to read, please, Dennis. Yeah. This is uh, Ellen White uh, from Review and Herald, September 17, 1889. Uh, Christ has said that we shall have the poor always with us. The heart of our Redeemer sympathizes with the lowliest of his earthly children. He tells us that they are his representatives on earth, placed among us to awaken in our hearts the love he feels toward the suffering and oppressed. Well, how, light, how bright is the light that your church focuses on the community? Is it a powerful beam? Or is it barely visible? And I ask you out there, has this lesson given you some new ideas about how to meet the needs of your community? Does it make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Can you think of ways in which you could reach out to help the poor and needy in your community? Each one of us lives in an environment. Everybody's environment is a little different. It might be easier for some and more difficult for others, but the commands are still there. Jesus says, you need to learn to be like me. And why does he ask that? Because someday we hope to live with him. And that's the time when we should have practiced to learn to be like him. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. Our common, kind and loving Father, we look at your example when you were here on this earth and it just amazes us. It makes us shrink back even sometimes to think, could we ever even begin to do what you did? But yet we know that your Holy Spirit is waiting, just waiting to work with us, to do everything that it's possible for a human being to do. And so... Help us to go forth from this lesson with the courage to try, at least to try, to reach out to those who need us most is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.